Hello, my lovely listeners. This is Fax Fivem, here with another lovely audio track. Today, I'm going to be going over Texas, the Land of Wealth and Fear, Part 1. Now you might be asking, didn't you already do Texas, the Land of Wealth and Fear? And the answer is, I thought I did. However, shortly after posting it, I realized that it was actually Part 2 of a two-part article series. So, today, I'm going over Part 1. Much like the previous article, it was written by Theodore H. White, who also, after posting the original video, I learned a neat fact about. He was the author of the book The Making of the President, 1960. Which, well, if you're a bit of a nerd like myself, you might be at least vaguely familiar with. He also wrote sequels in 1964 and 68 and some future years, I guess. I think he had to cut his teeth somewhere. Similarly, uh, well, with the last time I did this, it is hosted by uns.org, a website that bought up the rights to the archives of the Reporter magazine, and also is infamous for hosting Holocaust denial shit. I really don't know why that's the case, but it is. Well, without further ado, let's get in to Texas, the land of wealth and fear. Part 1 Blowing the base tuba the day it rained gold by Theodore H. White Originally published in the Reporter magazine on May 25th, 1954 All day the wind blows, it blows in easterly from the gulf or swings arid hot blowing from the west, or shifts hollowing down from the Great Plains to the north, dropping the temperature twenty degrees in an hour. The wind carries dust, dust in your throat, dust in a haze over the grey-rimmed horizon, dust twirled in fountains that sift and dance across the road. Even now in spring, when the plains should be green, they remain grey, the hills yellow-grey, the rocks red-grey, the mesquite black-grey. For five years now, since the drought began, this wind, scouring the soil from the face of Texas, has been uprooting and hurrying plainsmen toward the cities. But for twenty years before the drought, the plainsmen had been coming by bus, by train, by old farm truck, sucked irresistibly in towards the cities by the new industry and the new wealth of oil, as more lately they have been pushed relentlessly out by the parched waste of the plain. The villages that once drowsed in the sun about the placid center squares of courthouse and schoolhouse, Woolworth's and the J.C. Penney store have become towns. The towns have become cities whose cubes and towers thrust abrupt and unannounced from the plains. Between, in any direction across the map, men thin out year by year. The empty fields are speckled by the silent pumps whose rocking beams glide up and down, up and down, ceaselessly sucking oil from the depths and feeding the air with faint aromatic fumes of escaping gas. Twenty-five years ago, three out of every five Texans lived on farms or in villages. Today, Texas has eight million people, and only one out of four still live on farms or in villages. The rest are city people. The population of Texas has jumped two million since 1940, yet more than half of its counties have lost citizens. Most of the new city people are plainsmen or cotton farmers or ranchers from the southwest, but many are distant arrivals from New York or California, Tennessee or Illinois. All have come here for the same reason, to seek their fortune. Many have found it. But whatever their luck has been, all are strangers, rootless in place or time, in nervous new civilization of Texas cities. Within these new cities, bursting with energy and throbbing with the skills of modern industry, the ancient manners and morals of the American frontier still have superficial currency. From the old southwest, the citizens have remembered, or conformed to, the pattern of casual good manners, of easy courtesy in reply, the friendly hello in the street, the kindliness and helpfulness to wayfarers. And yet alone in the air-conditioned stillness behind the Venetian blinds, alone with their new wealth, these people know that the bonds that tied them to the frontier, that tied the frontiersmen to one another, are gone. Within 
their broods uneasy doubt as to their own role and that of their fellow citizens. A sense of menace, of unease, runs through their conversation, as if the great wheel of fortune might turn and suddenly deprive them of the wealth they have so lately won. And the menace may be anywhere, in a neighbor's home, around the corner, on the other side of town at Union headquarters, certainly in Washington and New York. In the heat of modern American problems, the prairie emotions tend to curdle neighborliness, becomes an excuse for the prowlings and slandering busybodies, and the sheriff's posse is corrupted into a lynching party for careers and reputations. This emotional climate would be no more than a matter of morbid or humorous interest to other Americans, as they watch a growing community fumble its way to maturity, were it not for another set of facts. That millions of Texans are convinced that their primary enemies are other Americans, and that the American experience in this age and generation has been a total failure, their own prosperity notwithstanding. That within Texas, the machinery of government, from the person of the governor down through the structure of both major parties, has been captured by a nameless third party, obsessed with hate, fear, and suspicion. One of whose central tenets is that, if America is ever destroyed, it will be from within. That a handful of prodigiously wealthy men, whose new riches give them a clumsy and immeasurable power, seek to spread this climate and their control throughout the rest of the United States. <clears throat> Ardent and devout states' writers at home, bellowing and snorting that the quote-unquote sovereign privileges of Texas must not be disturbed, these men see no contradiction in a Texas political imperialism that intervenes with its money in the domestic politics of 30 other quote-unquote sovereign states, from Connecticut to Washington, from Wisconsin to New Mexico. There is an element of cruel exaggeration in approaching the colorful diversity and complexity of Texas life through such men and the industry that made them rich. Oil. There is much more in Texas than oil. Texas is not only first in oil, over three billion dollars annually in production. It is also first in sulfur, first in cotton, first in rice, first in roses, first in chemicals, the industrial crescent among the Gulf, where natural gas is delivered at Tidewater, is the freshest frontier in American industry, and one of free enterprise's proudest achievements. But the exaggeration is thrust on any inquirer into Texas politics, because the men who have made their money out of oil are so immeasurably wealthier than any others, because on the American scene, their special privileges have become an anachronism, because with their riches they have tried to push the state of mind that is Texas across the nation. Furthermore, oil has captured the imagination of Texans in this generation the way cattle did a century ago. And all Texans, whether poor or rich, whether in oil or in no way remotely connected with it, are caught up in the excitement, turbulence, and emotions of an industry that feels its privileges menaced. Spindle top to the panhandle. The oil industry of the United States was half a century old. John D. Rockefeller had long since made his fortune, and Standard Oil was already a giant trust when a brilliant Montenegrin engineer named Captain Anthony F. Lucas, defying the most expert geological advice of his own day, drove a 1,160-foot 1 hole down through a sand hummock near the Gulf Coast, and on the clear morning of January 10th, 1901, saw a rise in a black, stinking fountain that spilled 25,000 to 100,000 barrels of oil each day over the surrounding countryside. Spindletop, which was the name of this discovery, was eventually to prove out at 100 million barrels, or one-tenth as much as all the oil produced in America in the previous half-century of the industry's existence. With the eruption at Spindletop, the entire structure of the American oil industry was ripped apart. The resources that gushed from the fields of the Southwest were too vast even for the mighty power of the Standard Trust to cap. Though Standard and its offshoots and rivals, such as Humble, Magnolia, Gulf, and Sun, 
were to follow the oil down from the oil fields in the northeast to the southwest. Their control of pipelines, markets, refineries, and research never gave them more than a collective suzerainty over the new empire. The real vigor and animal excitement of the industry was in the hands of a new breed of men, the quote-unquote independents, the boomers, prospectors, wildcatters, producers, and would-be producers. Out across Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana raced the treasure seekers, drilling in swamps, in deserts, on ranches and farms. By chicanery and rascality, vision and daring and courage, they created the industry of the oil fields. They leased and drilled and stole and cheated and fell from icy drilling platforms and blizzards to die finding the new gold. Riggers and roughnecks, leasemen and scholars, horse traders and gamblers, engineers and adventurers chased one another and chased oil for half a century in an industry that is still today the easiest to enter, the easiest to get rich in, and the easiest to go broken. Oil seemed to lie everywhere in Texas, as it seems to lie everywhere on the Great Slope down from the Rockies to the Gulf. By the mid-1920s, Texans had found oil from the Panhandle in the north to the border in the south, from the fringe of the Gulf to New Mexico in the west. Those were the days when, quote-unquote, depletion was born. Depletion is a sensitive word, and when talking to an oil man, you must approach the topic as cautiously as you would approach a discussion of his womanfolk's virtue. Depletion is the root of Texas oil fortunes, a loophole in the income tax laws of this country that gives oil millionaires magic exemption from tax burdens that all other citizens must bear. Depletion, when written into the tax laws of America in the early 1920s, justifiably expressed the anarchy of the early oil business. In those days, once a pool was discovered, as many men as possible bought the right to drill it. Like half a dozen children with their straws and one soda, each sucked oil as fast as possible to get to the most, while the getting was good. In their frantic and uncontrolled haste, they wrecked the early fields, letting the wonderfully valuable natural gas fizz off into the air to be flared as a waste product, while salt water crept in from underneath to ruin a well before a fraction of its predictable life had run. In those days, when a well's life might end in four, ten, or eight months, farmers, ranchers, producers, everyone with oil rights argued that income from oil was not just ordinary earnings. It was, they said, the depletion of a natural resource. The wastage of accumulated natural capital which, when gone, was all gone, like savings spent. So the federal tax laws gave oilmen a depletion allowance, which made 27.5% of all income from oil free and clear of any income tax. Like money drawn from a bank. Later we shall see how depletion permits men to have incomes of millions of dollars without paying any tax at all. Now this may sound infuriating, and it is. But I want to explain a little bit of the general idea of depletion based on my, I'll admit, amateurish Googling. So normally when you run a business, the longer the business is open, the better it is. You know, you're making more money, uh, you're getting more customers, it means you're successful. When it comes to a natural resource, however, there's a limited amount of stuff you can extract. So it becomes a bit of a contradiction. Unlike, say, a successful restaurant that may end up becoming more profitable over the years and therefore more valuable, the more profitable and longer a mine is open, say, the less valuable it becomes because then there's fewer of a resource you can extract. Ideally, and I say ideally because, well, let's be real, ideals and reality don't always mesh well together, but ideally the purpose of this a tax loophole is to account for the fact that the more successful your business becomes, the less time you'll have to actually produce or extract a resource from it. That being said, the oil depletion allowance is still a thing. I'm looking at its Wikipedia page right now. It says... President Harry S. Truman unsuccessfully proposed repealing the allowance. Efforts in Congress in 1969 to reduce dramatically or to eliminate the allowance were successfully 
beat back by big oil lobbyists. A cut in the depletion allowance deduction was enacted, however, reducing the deduction from 27.5% to 23%. I'm also looking at the Investopedia article for depletion allowances and for modern day stuff. It says the IRS sets different depletion rates for different resources. Some of the rates are as follows. Oil and gas, 15%. Sand, gravel, and crushed stone, 5%. Borax, granite, limestone, marble, mollusk shells. Potash, slate, soapstone, and carbon dioxide produced from a well, 14%. Sulfur and uranium, 23%. Gold, silver, copper, iron ore, and certain oil shale from U.S. deposits, 15%. So I guess it has been reduced to 15%. The next climactic event in oil, an event that shook the industry almost as completely as spindle drop, took place 150 miles to the north in the peanut and sweet potato patches of Rusk County, near Turnertown. There, in October of 1930, a broken-down old wildcatter named Dad Joyner had sunk his last few pennies in a ramshackle drilling rig, which, at 3,600 feet, suddenly hit oil. What Dad Joyner hit was the largest single pool of oil ever to be discovered in these United States before or since. The Great East Texas Pool which, with some five billion barrels, overmatched in lush wealth, the wildest dreams of fantasy, the East Texas pool drenched the shrinking markets of America in depression, and they promptly collapsed. Prices dropped from 40 to 20 to 10, and in some places to five cents a barrel. Drowning in oil, crippled with abundance, Texas called out its National Guard and proclaimed martial law in the fields. Near riots broke out, men ran hot oil against regulation, shot and killed each other, while for two years the state sought to establish order with new laws. FDR, non-interventionist. Finally, one Sunday in April 1933, in the Chinese room of the Mayflower Hotel at Washington, all the representatives of the nation's oil industry gathered to memorialize Franklin D. Roosevelt, president for a month, asking him to appoint a czar to take over the entire oil industry and control it for its own preservation. Mr. Roosevelt, whose name is now a cuss word among oilmen who preach states' rights and freedom from any control, refused and insisted that Texas and other producing states work out their own controls. This Texas did, and some of the wisest conservation laws ever passed. These laws ordained proration, which simply established the right of the state of Texas through its railway commission to conserve the natural resources of the state. The commission now establishes the quote-unquote allowable amount of oil each individual may take daily from any well he drills, penalizes operators for wasteful practices, and makes the utilization of natural gas compulsory. In short, proration guarantees that oil and gas will be withdrawn from the ground only under conditions that guarantee maximum longevity and maximum yield for the field. The depletion percentage is still 27.5, which arbitrarily averages a well's life at less than four years, but oil wells may last 10, 20, 30, or more under these new regulations. With order established, the industry was mature, that is, it could be financed. Previously, no bank would lend money against a field that might be depleted in a month. Now, with reserves scientifically judged and allocated, oil underground was bank collateral. Banks could finance a hit, and one lucky hit meant the, the underground collateral would finance 10 or 20 more tries. It meant that fortunes could be pyramided quickly, which they were. Meanwhile, too, the price of oil was rising. A barrel of oil is now worth $2.56. Scientific methods of discovery were bringing in ever more numerous fields. War boomed production, and income taxes for the wealthy climbed to the confiscatory levels that national defense made and still makes necessary. These new taxes superimposed on their new wealth made Texas oilmen explore another area of special grace accorded them under the industry's peculiar tax laws, a benefit equal to or greater than depletion in importance. In the oil industry, all new drilling expenses may be charged off against income as current expense. 
Let us suppose that an individual has an income of $5 million from oil. Depletions, 27.5%, gives him a cool $1,375,000 clear and free of any tax bill. This he may pocket. The remaining $3,625,000 is subject to tax, but why let it accumulate to be taxed away by the federal government at 85%? Why not, as the phrase runs, go out and drill it up? To drill it up means you spend the $3,625,000 in vastly expanded drilling and exploration for more oil. If you lose, the money spent would have been taxed anyway, anyhow. If you win and hit you have discovered reserves of thousands of barrel that are a capital asset as good as money in the bank. If you sell such a discovery, it is taxed as a capital gain. No other industry can make such capital investments and write them off out of pocket. Currently looking at the Investopedia page on oil, it says... Several major tax benefits are available for oil and gas companies and investors that are found nowhere else in the tax code. Tangible costs, which pertain to the actual direct cost of the drilling equipment, are 100% deductible but must be depreciated over seven years. Intangible drilling costs generally constitute a 65-80% to 80 of the total cost of drilling a well and are 100% deductible in the year incurred. Lease operation costs and all administrative, legal, and accounting expenses can be deducted over the life of the lease. While I can't speak for how it's changed since the mid-1950s, it is clear that a lot of these deductions are still in the U.S. tax code, and as Investopedia so nicely put it, you can't find these types of deductions in any other industry. There is a defense to be made of depletion, of course, for oil removed from the ground is depleted and gone, a natural asset reduced. Some allowance, even the federal tax collectors argue, is necessary. The question is, how much? Shall depletion be permitted at 27.5% only until the original investment in exploration and drilling is recovered, and then be sharply reduced to, say, 10 or 12%? Or shall it be flatly reduced across the board to match the estimated life of the field? Oilmen make another defense, that depletion and other benefits are needed to keep risk money flowing, to keep men gambling to find the new oil we require. For all the recent stabilization of the oil industry, it still involves a vast element of risk. It is a game of chance in which chips, wells, cost from 30000 to a million dollars each. Of every seven holes drilled, six on the average are quote-unquote dusters. Tens of thousands of men have gone broke punching dry holes. Scores of thousands from New York to California have pooled their savings behind a wildcatter or driller for just one try at the rewards depletion promises and have lost everything. For every man who has made his millions, hundreds have vanished penniless. Even old Dad Joyner died broke, bargained out of his discovery by the sharpest operator of all, H. L. Hunt. The day it rained gold. All this controversy, the facts are that with oil coming in all over the map of Texas, with tens of thousands seeking it, with pools of it to be found one out of seven times, it was mathematically predictable that a certain number of men, protected by depletion and capital gains, would become fantastically wealthy, and that depletion and capital gains in their present form would become their main articles of faith. The thing to remember about most of the very richest is that 25 years ago, they were flat. They were poor only yesterday, won their wealth during the hated New Deal's, quote, 20 years of treason and shame, end quote, and now are the richest men in the world. They feel and insist that they won their wealth by their own exertions, which of course they did, in a rough fight in which courage as well as luck was vital. But as one Texas elder statesman put it, they were standing there blowing the base tuba the day it rang gold. Now for reasons some of which are in their pocketbook and some of which they could not rationally explain, they feel themselves acutely menaced over and over again. Northern congressmen make mumbled noises about doing something to subject oilmen to the same tax burdens as less privileged citizens. 
over and over again, the federal government proposes to regulate the natural gas industry more strictly. Washington is, has been, and can be dangerous. As this has made most oilmen states' writers, which means, said a Midwestern businessman recently arrived in Texas, quote, they want the federal budget balanced, but they don't want it to be balanced with their money. End quote. Finally, the Texas tycoons of oil have missed the great maturing experience of American businessmen, which is the management of labor, of human beings en masse. The oilmen are quote-unquote producers, and in no other field of human endeavor can so much wealth be gotten with the employment of so few human beings. Theirs is a business of buying and trading in leases, hiring rigs, and sinking holes with twenty-odd men selling crude to big companies by telephone. Once a well is in, it works almost untended, feeding oil or gas from the ground to the pipelines. The American businessman or manufacturer, no matter how ferocious and bitter he may be about unions, has had, as a matter of efficiency, to learn to deal with human beings in mine, mill, factory, and department store as employees and as unions. This experience the Texas oilmen have skipped. Now that's peak 1950s, talking about how businessmen have accepted unions and are willing to work with them. Yeah. Nowadays you can hardly say the union beat the confederacy without having a team of corporate lawyers breathing down your neck. It is, of course, unfair to speak thus of a whole group of people. Texas oilmen are no more cut of one pattern than are the steelmen of the Ruhr. Among them one can find men of remarkable erudition and culture, such as Everett Lee de Goyler, greatest of living oil geologists and patron of the arts. One can find men like J.R. Parton, alternating between public service and the oil industry, whose loyalty to the America of this generation outweighs the parochial loyalty to the industry that gave him his wealth. One can find Texas millionaires who import snow from the Rockies for their parties, and others who buy masterpieces of French painting. The Export of Fear but the community of oilmen as a whole is a community gripped by fear that Washington may erase its privileges. Along with them, in this fear, the oilmen have swept farmers, landowners, merchants, lawyers, all who have stakes or hope to place a bet on the roulette wheel of oil. They have persuaded their fellow citizens, as one public relations campaign phrased it, that if you're a Texan, you're in the oil business. Together, they have muddied the image of their fears so that the fear of Washington is blurred with the fear of communism, the fear of war, fear of other Americans. This is like one of those things that just really never changes. You got these annoying Dixie elites who, you know, they want the budget to be balanced, but they don't want it to be balanced with their money. You know, say whatever you want about taxes. They're inevitable, death and taxes, so you're gonna have to pay something. Gotta make your peace with it, I guess. I mean, unless you're a kooky philosopher of sorts, if you can create some sort of kooky tax-free philosophy, it'd be interesting to read about how that could work. Uh, but practically speaking, you kind of just gotta deal with taxes. Sorry. I don't like dealing with them either. But at the same time, it's just this fact that these are literally some of the richest men in America at the time, and yet they're acting like they are the victims because they have to, well, rather Washington was proposing that they pay the same taxes as everyone else. Oh my fucking god. Putting them on the same level with the commoners? Okay, yeah, you took a risk. Well, guess what? A lot of people, they take risks and they fucking fail. And they're not getting all of their lost money written off, or at least not in the way that you probably think they are. I mean, I know these guys are yelling at their long dead at this point, but may as well. In this case, as the author pointed out, a lot of people who try their luck on oil, they lose absolutely everything. And they don't get any special privileges for losing everything. They still gotta go to work and pay their taxes like the fucking rest of us. And it really just infuriates me when the people who are successful see their success as a sign that they're better than the rest of us. You know what? Most people don't want to be super duper million billionaires most people just want to live a decent freaking life with their families and, you know, just be happy and enjoy themselves, have a meaningful reason to live. And 
yet these people who I, I will, you know what, I, I, I will commend them for their success in business. I will respect that they risked a lot of money. They're basically annoyed that they could possibly be kept to the same standards as everyone else. It's elitist as fuck. I don't know if I'd call it popular elitist. Maybe. Yeah, when I, when I eventually get to the Earth fascism essay, I'll rant a lot more about popular elitism. Anyway, back to this one. Not only that, being vigorous, aggressive men who have won their fortunes by doing and acting, they feel the best defense is a good offense. Thus, they have entered politics as they have entered oil, staking a bet on a representative here or a senator there. Most are little operators with thousands and five thousand dollar chips, whose belief it is that the Congress of the United States may be manipulated or cozened as it's a backward state legislature. Occasionally, a number pool their cash to take out advertisements in political campaigns as far afield as Denver and San Francisco. Among these political dabblers, however, are four whose wealth is so prodigious that their fumblings with national politics cannot be ignored. Country boys, all strangers in the big city, their efforts, sometimes naive, sometimes shrewd, to remold America to their image are worth more than a casual glance. Hugh Roy Cullen of Houston, at the age of 72, is the dean of the group. A man whose education stopped at the third grade, Cullen was brought up on a farm in Denton County. His elevation to the eminence of local sage and sackum can be dated almost precisely from the day when his drillers in 1934 brought in the Tom O'Connor Hill, whose half billion barrels of reserves Mr. Cullen now shares with the great Humble Oil Company. I was a bit confused as to why such a wealthy man ran a company called the Humble Oil Company. It turns out that Humble is the area in Texas that it's most likely named after. A large, raw-boned, handsome old man whose face glows with the ruddiness usually associated with the steady drinker. Cullen is an authentic primitive. Even in Houston, Cullen is a character, a figure of both affection and a friendly jest, of whom it is irreverently said that he has reversed the old Texas gag from, if you're so smart, why ain't you rich, to, if he's so rich, why ain't he smart? The affection for Cullen in Houston is easy to understand, for his status as a benefactor is unmatched in local annals. He has spent money lavishly on hospitals, churches, orphanages, old people's homes, and schools. His most favored charity is the University of Houston, to which he has given oil properties he considers to be worth $160 million, and which even other oil men appraise at around $80 million. These gestures, gratifying as they are to the inner man, have also produced a steady stream of local headlines, intoxicating to ego and pride. They have further produced in the community of Houston a desire to pamper the testy, often tearful old man in his foibles just as far as can be done. Thus, the University of Houston boasts in its student officer corps a unit called the Cullen Rifles, for which Cullen provides the uniforms. In the days when he was the largest contributor, $20,000 a year, to the Houston Symphony, the orchestra would play Old Black Joe to soothe its benefactor at otherwise austere concerts. Even when, at the university commencement exercises, Mr. Cullen became angry at the invocation of the preacher and pushed him bodily away from the microphone, no one protested very much. Cullen had found the preacher's invocation doleful, and besides, he was just a little fellow anyway. But when, finally, one night on the radio, Mr. Cullen called Dean Acheson a homosexual, even the local stations had to cut him off. As a reminder, Dean Acheson was the Secretary of State under President Harry Truman. Also, I think that this article demonstrates my personal issue with the philosophy of philanthropy as the best way to produce the common good. Now, I'm not referring to, like, usually small local individuals improving their community, but rather I'm referring to the fact that when you're as immensely wealthy as this man, and you can just 
you know, donate people's entire yearly salaries like it's nothing, it means that that individual becomes very powerful. That specific individual can effectively determine the future of various philanthropic organizations, whether they be absolutely necessary or not for the community. Like one hypothetical example, if a public library holds any books he doesn't like, he can just threaten to stop donating money unless they remove those books. Similarly, if a hospital, I don't know, maybe a hospital started offering like women's reproductive health stuff, and he would say, all right, I'm going to just stop donating large sums of money unless you do what I want. And I don't feel comfortable with any one individual holding that much power. <laughs> Cullen became interested in politics during the late New Deal, which he loathes with incandescent fury, and war years, while Jesse Jones, grandmaster of the local political machine, was in Washington, feuding with the Messers, Wallace, and Roosevelt. Since the return of Jesse Jones to Houston after the war, Mr. Cullen has gone into a slight eclipse as a local oracle, an eclipse probably hastened by his famous published protest that, quote, Jones has been away from here for the last 25 to 30 years and has come back to Houston and decided with the influence of a bunch of New York Jews to run our city. Before I get to the obvious part, I just want to point out that Jesse Jones was a Texas businessman. He was a member of the Democratic Party, the ninth United States Secretary of Commerce, and at least looking at his Wikipedia page, it looks like he had his own attempts in various politics. Specifically looking at Mr. Cullen, <laughs> Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> so, how do I... I'll just read it from the wiki page. Cullen had been in his early life a Democrat, but supported Herbert Hoover and other Republicans after 1929 due to the belief that the Democratic Party was, at the national level, the party of machine politics and socialism, labeling FDR's politics, quote, the Jew deal, end quote. Yep. Y you know, you know, y y y y y y you fucking, don't you hate it when the left moves so far left as to become the party of the Jews and socialism? Damn Jew deal. Seriously, if the left wants to win, they have to stop being so Jewish. Ike, attend to this. In national politics, however, Mr. Cullen's interest has been unflagging, and he takes a constant, meticulous interest in affairs of state. He showers President Eisenhower, senators and congressmen with telegrams and letters whenever the mood seizes him. You know, he explained in January of this year, I groomed Ike for the presidency. He's a swell fellow, but he's got some damned people around him who are inexperienced. In March, he elaborated, in my opinion, Eisenhower, the Republican Party, and the country itself would be a lot better off if the president listened more attentively to Joe Martin and Joe McCarthy than he does to Dewey, Lodge, and Stassen. Harold Stassen, director of the Foreign Operations Administration, has particularly aroused Cullen's ire not only for his politics, but as an ingrate. You take this Stassen, Cullen said recently. He is a likable cuss. I furnished him some money to run for the nomination so he could then give the votes to Ike. He almost didn't. I said, Harold, you won't do. Mentally, you're conservative, but at heart, you're a socialist. This is going to be me geeking out a little bit over some neat historical politics and... Well, the politics of voting and the math of voting, I do find the math of voting pretty interesting. Lots of neat ways to, to tally votes. But first, some basic explanations. First off, Joe McCarthy. Almost everyone who is American listening to this probably knows who Joe McCarthy was. He was a demagogue, a senator from Wisconsin, who basically just called everyone he disagreed with a communist. In fact, my grandfather, who was, like, 
yeah, he would have been like, you know, 10 or 11 around the height of McCarthyism. He talked about how his family was too afraid to talk politics because they didn't want to be smeared as Jewish communists. And they were just, you know, your typical New York City liberal New Deal Jews. Joe Martin, according to his Wikipedia page, he was a Speaker of the House from 47 to 49 and 53 to 55. He represented uh, somewhere in Massachusetts and was a quote-unquote compassionate conservative who opposed the New Deal and supported the conservative coalition of Republicans and Southern Democrats. Dewey refers to the same guy from the whole Dewey defeats Truman image that you are probably at least vaguely familiar with. He was a pretty liberal Republican and a good friend of Ike. Lodge refers to Henry Cabot Lodge, well technically Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., who was a moderate Republican from well, Massachusetts as well. He was Richard Nixon's running mate in the 1960 presidential bid. He was ambassador to the United Nations and later America's ambassador to South Vietnam, so you might have heard of his name in discussions about the Vietnam War. Now, for Stassen and for me geeking out. Any Americans who are listening to this are almost certainly well aware of the seemingly endless presidential primary cycle, which happens every four to eight years, depending on what party you're in. Nowadays, the whole delegate thing seems a bit weird because literally every state has members of its state vote on, well, vote for candidates. Now, technically speaking, you are voting for delegates who then vote for your candidate. And it, it did confuse me for a while, too, and I did some, well, I'll admit it, amateurish research, but I was able to piece together the general concepts of how these things used to work. So for a very long time, most states did not have these directly elected primaries. The way it generally worked was you would have a political boss who, under him, had a bunch of delegates from their state. Those delegates would often go, quote-unquote, unpledged. What would happen is that the political boss would do some behind-the-scenes negotiation in smoky rooms with the various candidates. They would then uh, get their unpledged delegates to vote for whichever candidate the boss wanted them to. And then should that candidate win presidency, the president would then kick back some patronage to the boss, who in turn would kick back some patronage to the delegates. Regarding 1952, the Republican Party was in a bit of a soul-searching moment. They lost five presidential elections in a row, four to Roosevelt, one to Truman. And at this point in time, there were effectively two main wings of the Republican Party. You had the isolationist conservatives and the more moderate to liberal internationalists. Now, sometimes the internationalism or the isolationism may have crossed over lines, but Generally speaking, these were the two main camps. The moderate to liberal wing, they were sometimes known as the Eastern Establishment, that later called the Rockefeller Republicans after New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller. Both sides of the Republican Party were arguing their case, and the general argument was as follows. The moderate libs, or the mods to libs, Moderate to liberal. Yeah, I was calling them the mods, the mod to lib. Or, you know, just, just the conservatives and everyone else. That'll be easier. The conservative side argued that the Republican Party was so busy trying to mimic Franklin Roosevelt that they effectively isolated the conservative voters in the United States, causing them to basically just not vote, giving FDR the massive victories he did, oh, and also Harry Truman, while everyone else, or the other wing, argued that due to FDR and Harry Truman's victories, it's clear that liberal American liberalism and moderation are what is in, and that if we try to run a conservative candidate, they'll just get trounced anyway. In order to win the nomination for president in the Republican Party at this point, you needed 604 delegates. When the nomination process started, Dwight Eisenhower, who was on the Mod to Lib side, came in with 595 delegates, while Ohio Senator Robert Taft, who was kind of the de facto leader of the conservative side of the party, came in with 500 delegates. 
There were, however, three other candidates. The first was Governor Earl Warren of California, who later became, I'd say, the most based Supreme Court justice of, uh, in American history. Probably the most based guy to come from California. <laughs> well, at least most based dead guy. I'm sure there are some people who are alive from Cali whom I might consider more based, but I'll have to look into that later. You then had Harold Stanson, mentioned earlier, the former governor of Minnesota, who was a liberal moderate Republican, and General Douglas MacArthur, who was fresh off his firing from military service after trying to convince President Truman to give him a bunch of nukes to bomb Manchuria and the Korean Peninsula to end the Korean War. Now, Harold Stan now even though Dwight Eisenhower came in with 595 out of the 604 uh, delegates he needed to win, there was a bit of a, how do we say, stalemate. Regarding the exact rules of the convention, I'll just read from the Wikipedia paragraph. <clears throat> After the nominations were completed, including speeches on behalf of Earl Warren, Harold Stassen, and Douglas MacArthur, the delegates proceeded to vote. After the first ballot, Eisenhower had 595 votes, nine short of the nomination, which required 604. Taft had 500, Warren 81, Stassen 20, and MacArthur 10. Warren's backers refused to change their votes to Eisenhower because they still hoped for a deadlock that might enable Warren to obtain the nomination as a compromise choice. Stassen had not received 10% of the vote, which freed his home state Minnesota delegates from their pledge to support him. Most of the Stassen delegates, led by Warren E. Berger, changed their votes to Eisenhower, which gave him the 614 votes and the presidential nomination. Other delegations then began to switch to Eisenhower, and, well, he, he won. Now, so yeah, basically what happened was, you know, the liberal Republican of Minnesota, he didn't have very many delegates, but he had just enough to tip the scales to Eisenhower, and he tipped the scales to Eisenhower, and then a bunch of other delegates were like, oh shit, Eisenhower's gonna win, I should just cast my vote for him now. And, well, when you're, when you're a rich, paranoid conservative like our old boy Cullen, well, you can see why he hates Stassen so much. Anyway, back to the essay. Most lately, since the president has opposed the Bricker Amendment, an increasing exasperation has been creeping into to Cullen's telegrams. One recent communication to the White House ended, Ike, I hope you will not wait, but attend to this important matter immediately. It is quite clear down in Houston that Cullen is giving the president one more chance to be good in these last few months. It is equally clear in which direction his allegiance has shifted. Cullen, when he sponsors a man, does it up well and usually starts by arranging a triumphal introductory tour through Texas for his choice. Senator Taft was so honored by Mr. Cullen in his heyday, as were Generals MacArthur and Eisenhower. Cullen's favor has most recently settled on Senator Joe McCarthy, whom he styled as the greatest man in America a few weeks ago when he personally sponsored the senator's visit to deliver the commemorative address on San Jacinto Day. Coming from another man, such mouthings might appear to be an advanced case of senile dementia. In Mr. Cullen's case, they are not. They are immodest and perhaps untruthfully boastful, but they are buttressed with a purse and with action that make him, even in his fumbling, untutored crudity, one of the nation's most ambitious investors in political futures. Resenting as he does the slightest trace of northern money or influence in sovereign Texas, in 1952, <clears throat> Cullen persuaded his conscience to put money down in no less than 23 other states beyond his native soil. His contributions went to campaigns in Wisconsin, McCarthy, Indiana, Jenner, Idaho, Maine, Connecticut, New Mexico, Washington, Nevada, Utah, Missouri, Montana, California, where he financed five candidates, including that of Representative Ernest Bramblett, since convicted of kickbacks and extortions, Virginia, Illinois, Maryland, New York, Ohio, New Hampshire, North Dakota, and New Jersey. His sons-in-law went into Wyoming, Michigan, and Arizona. His political gambles were even better than wildcat drilling, 
In some 34 campaigns where Cullen money was staked, 22 of his choices were made winners and only a dozen were losers. Jenner was a senator from Indiana from 47 through 59, and he was a McCarthyist. Oy vey. You know, one part of me wants to comment more on the rather humorous and likely deliberate juxtaposition in which he talks about Mr. Cullen not liking any northern money and thus well, investing his money in political races all over the country. But honestly, d did you expect anything less? In 1952, Cullen recorded direct contributions of $53,000 and his sons-in-law $19,750 or more. Since it is axiomatic in American politics that recorded contributions are like the tip of the iceberg, revealing only the smallest fraction of what is spent in elections, it may be assumed that Cullen has tried to influence many others. His contributions to Harold Stassen have been noted. He has been credited with a share in the defeat of former Senators Scott Lucas of Illinois and Frank, Gra Frank Graham of North Carolina and Claude Pepper of Florida. In Houston, one informed estimate of his total political expenditures during 51 and 52 comes to $750,000. Mr. Cullen is essentially a simple man, fortified with perhaps the naive belief that with enough money he can engineer passage of the Brooker Amendment, make presidents, and control congressmen. It is doubtful whether he has any theology or ideology about how he would change and remake the United States. The only thing that seems certain is he wants it changed. The Brooker Amendment was a proposed constitutional amendment. Said amendment has appeared various times throughout U.S. history, but around this time, the Brooker Amendment would have, for all intents and purposes, made it more difficult for the president to negotiate in foreign um, relations, as it would have required more authority from the Senate to approve more forms of foreign relations and negotiations and whatnot. You may recall from earlier when I referenced the isolationist conservative wing of the Republican Party, this wing of that party, as well as some Democrats, specifically wanted, uh, well, America to well, back out of foreign policy because after World War II, America began taking a much more aggressive role in foreign policy throughout the world, and the isolationists did not like that. They never did get the Bricker Amendment passed. Just two country boys. The next two in the grand quadrumvirate of Texas oilmen are Sid Richardson of Fort Worth and Clint Murchison of Dallas. Richardson and Murchison are different in essence from Cullen in that while Cullen is intoxicated with politics, Richardson and Murchison can take it or leave it alone. Close friends ever since their boyhood in the little cotton town of Athens, Texas, both still assume the air of homespun country boys. Sid and Clint, said one Dallasite, are both nice guys. They have only the simplest, most innocent desire in the world, to make money. All they want is more. In this pursuit of more, Sid has outstripped his chum Clint by several leagues, as he has outstripped probably every other living individual in the United States. There is an almost monastic purity in Richardson's single-minded devotion to the pursuit of wealth, a country trader who graduated from trading in bits and pieces of land, he entered the oil industry almost inevitably as a leaseman, a specialist in the brokerage and huckstering of oil leases. Today, Dallas is full of men who claim to remember when Sid Richardson wore patches on his pants or had to borrow bus fare to get from Dallas to Fort Worth. The turning point of his career seems to have been reached in the cold December of 1933, when, wildcatting out in Winkler County in West Texas, his fortunes reached so low a point that local grocers refused him credit to buy food for his drillers, and Sid had to go all the way to Fort Worth and truck borrowed groceries to his men for Christmas. Sid hit modestly on that one, but the big money did not flow until he hit the Keystone Sands in 1937. From then on, Sid rolled. 
By the time he first met Dwight Eisenhower, who had just been made a brigadier general, on a train from Texas to Washington, Sid's income was over $2 million a year, or in terms of oil, 8,000 barrels of quote-unquote allowable a day. The find that projected him to the stratosphere of wealth did not come until 1943, when, on a tract of lease holdings he had purchased for $332,000, the famous Ellenberger Lime was discovered. The reserves there were an, at an estimated 250 million barrels, and as if fortune were not yet tired, when Sid moved his operations on to Louisiana in the post-war years, he made a Another monster strike at Cox Bay, estimated at 250 million barrels, which makes him far and away the richest American, with the possible exception of his Dallas neighbor H.L. Hunt, who may be his only rival in the billion dollar bracket. Nothing seems to have interfered with Richardson in his quest for treasure. He is unmarried and has no children. He lives alone in an apartment in the Fort Worth Club with a collection of Remington and Russell paintings, philanthropy holds little, if any, interest for him. One day during a trip across the country, after the Keystone discovery had already made Richardson rich, a traveling companion asked him, Sid, why don't you give Dallas a children's hospital? Dallas hasn't got a children's hospital. Sid said, now if I do that, why everyone in the world will come around asking me for money and I just don't want to be bothered. Sid's friends accept this attitude, for the man has no pretense. Why, Sid has no more civic responsibility than a coyote, one of them said, but he's a nice guy. No particular connection can be made between Richardson and any of the grosser forms of political manipulation. Texas Democrats of both the Shivercrat and the Loyalist persuasions consider Richardson still a Democrat. His friendship with Sam Rayburn is warm and enduring, along with a small minority of the Texas rich he has shown no enthusiasm for Joe McCarthy. According to the website politicaldictionary.com, Shivercrats were a conservative faction of the Texas Democratic Party in the 1950s named for Texas Governor Alan Shivers. The term was first coined in 52 after Shivers backed Republican Dwight Eisenhower for president over Democrat Adlai Stevenson. Politics, for him, seems to be simply the pleasures of association with the great and the respect the stark and massive dimensions of his wealth can earn from them in return. His association with Elliot Roosevelt in a Texas radio station was good for several meals at the White House before Sid took over the property when Elliot went off to war. His early meeting with Eisenhower has flowered into a fine friendship. When Sid flew off to Paris to visit Eisenhower at Shape, the trip had none of the flavor of a self-appointed political mission, but was rather a call on the general by an old friend who advised him to run for the presidency as a Democrat. Sid has since been a guest at the White House, perhaps a return invitation for the vacation he gave the Eisenhowers in 1949 on his private island off the Gulf Coast, and his loyalty to Eisenhower remains undiminished. Content with his friends, an occasional drink, and an evening of canasta or poker, Sid Richardson behaves like a thoroughly happy man. Clint. Clint Murchison is, by all odds, a far more complex human being than his crony Sid. A stocky, rumpled man with an open and seemingly friendly expression, Murchison is described by some Dallas businessmen as a genius. Quote, like all geniuses and near geniuses, one of them has said, Clint is a successful neurotic. Except where some geniuses paint paintings and make music, Clint makes deals. The base and core of the Murchison wealth is oil. Murchison's interest in oil began in the early 1920s when lured into it by his boyhood friend Sid Richardson, he began to play around with leasing, drilling, and wildcatting. Like H.L. Hunt, Murchison achieved his present stature in the East Texas oil pool where he seems to have been a front-rank performer in running and dealing in quote-unquote hot oil in the days when proration was being established under National Guard bayonets. Murchison went on to found the Delhi Oil Company to pioneer some of the first big natural gas developments in North Texas, and was far, far above the field when the classical forms of oil accumulation had begun to pall on him, and he lifted his eyes beyond the confines of the state. Until his recent sortie into Wall Street's battle of 
the New York Central, Murchison's business ambitions seemed to be satisfied with biting off a series of small-sized $2 to $20 million properties. The cadence and diversity of these acquisitions is reflected only in part by the headlines in the business section of the local paper. Dallas Man opens Brownsville Bank. Murchison buys Vault Firm. Murchison buys Control of Cargo Line. Dallasite participates in Venezuela Purchase. Hidden Bait Firm bought by Dallasite. Murchison buys Magazine. Local Oilman wins place in Canadian Line. Texas-owned California Hotel to open for business. Two Texans buy Big New York Central Block. The records of Murchison's eleemosynary activities provide a rather odd counterpoint to this drumfire of headlines. The Murchison Enterprises in philanthropy best known to the public are the erection of seven prefabricated huts to house students at North Texas State College, two opportunity awards to be given annually for five years to students at Texas Agricultural and Mechanical College, a gift of 197 stuffed birds, coastal Texas specimens, to Southern Methodist University, and finally, prizes totaling $50 in a contest for left-handed fiddlers. The latter were carefully stipulated as $25 for first prize, $15 for the second, and $10 for the third win, place, and show. The headlines have omitted mention of the enterprises Murchison has dabbled in, and then withdrawn from, or which he has dabbled in and controlled without publicity. They have not mentioned his abortive effort to buy a chain of a hundred Texas newspapers during the Second World War, his control of Henry Holt and Company, New York publishers. They have also ignored what is common knowledge in Dallas, that Old Clint is an equity man, his finances entangled in a bookkeeper's mayor's nest of bank credit and stock deals. Sometimes believed by Northerners to be the wealthiest of all Texans, Murchison is considered in Dallas the most vulnerable of the really big rich. To keep his status, Clint must keep going in, business as well as politics. In extenuation of that fact that Murchison, like Cullen and Hunt, has been publicly associated with Senator McCarthy for the past four years, his friends plead the simplest of excuses, that it's necessary for business. They say that if he put money in the New Mexico gubernatorial race, it was because he had utilities there, that when he tried to get pipeline transmission rights to bring Canadian natural gas down to the United States, he made strenuous efforts to contact the Duke of Windsor, believing that the Duke had valuable Canadian contacts. If Murchison supports McCarthy, they say, it's simply because he's looking for winners in Washington. All in all, Clint told a reporter, he has put something less than $40,000 into McCarthy, including expenses for the private airplane Murchison has several times provided to fly the senator into and around Texas. Murchison's first contact with McCarthy occurred in 1950, when a relayed request from the senator found Clint ready to put up $10,000 in the famous campaign that licked Senator Millard H. Tidings of Maryland with faked photos of Tiding and Earl Browder in a chummy attitude. In 1952, Clint put up money to help McCarthy defeat William Benton in Connecticut and for McCarthy's broadcast attack on Stevenson from Chicago. Looking at the Wikipedia page for the various figures, the first one up is Millard Tidings, who was a U.S. Senator from Maryland. The other man named Mr. Earl Browder was the head of the United States Communist Party. and. Yeah, there was some, you know, edited photos, or at least somewhat manipulated photos that made it seem as if the senator and the leader of the U.S. Communist Party were buddy-buddy. As for William Benton, he was a senator from the state of Connecticut, and, well, his Wikipedia page has a little blurb about this, so... In the November 1950 election, he defeated Republican Party candidate Prescott Sheldon Bush, father of U.S. President George Herbert Walker Bush and grandfather of U.S. President George W. Bush. In 1951, he introduced a resolution to expel Joseph McCarthy from the Senate. Benton provided 30,000 words of testimony on September 28, 1951 in support of Senate Resolution 187. Due to Benton's resolution and McCarthy's response, the Senate Rule Committee investigated and criticized both of them but punished neither. On television, when asked if he would take any action against Benton's re-election bid, McCarthy replied, 
I think it will be unnecessary. Little Willie Benton, Connecticut's mental midget keeps on. It'll be unnecessary for me or anyone else to do any campaigning against him. He's doing his campaigning against himself. He then, well, lost the general election. As for whether or not that specific statement from McCarthy helped to defeat Benton, I don't know, but this is almost certainly what the author is referencing. As for attacking Stevenson from Chicago, Adlai Stevenson was the Democrat who ran against Dwight Eisenhower. He was also an Illinois politician. Murchison's friends insist that he does all this without any particular passion or malice. And despite Murchison's hospitality to McCarthy during the San Jacinto Day visit, they say the relationship is cooling. As evidence, they point out that Murchison took the senator sternly to task last October for not defending Air Force Lieutenant Milo J. Radulovich when the latter was accused of disloyalty because of his family's leftist tendencies. They stress that Murchison is no fanatic, no monomaniac, no ideologue. The same year that Clint put up $10,000 to help McCarthy lick Benton, he donated $1,000 to the Democratic National Committee. If Senator McCarthy starts to slip, they predict that Murchison will discard him. He will turn out to have been a political dry hole. Several attributes beside the immeasurable extent of their wealth bracket these three country boys who have made good. All three have earned a certain reservoir of affection from their fellow citizens, whether through their generosity, as in Colden's case, or their homespun charm, as in the case of Murchison and Richardson. Their political ventures have in common an old-fashioned directness, typified by the belief that influence can be achieved simply by money and key contacts. The fourth man in the quadrumvirate, Haroldson L. Hunt of Dallas, is set apart from the others, first by the quality of foreboding and distaste that his name arouses even in the very rich, and second by the fact that he has learned that nowadays, massive wealth to defend itself, its prerogatives, and its principles must have at its disposal massive means of communication. This is the first of two installments of Mr. White's article on Texas. The article ends here. I will say it is a pity I did not know about this ahead of time. But, you know what? I think it's a nice addition, a nice real scene setter. I will say I didn't find this particularly as fascinating and relevant as the second one was, but I still think it's rather interesting a way to look at the emergence of, well, let's be real here, the modern-day far-right paranoia that is all too fucking common. Like, looking at all four of these guys, well, technically it's the three rich oil men in this article, then H.L. Hunt in the next one, it seems that they're all, you know, I can respect that they're all self-made millionaires or self-made to an extent. I really can't say how self-made anyone truly is due to the sheer oddities and complexities of all of our lives. But at the same time, they were driven by just this paranoia that came with their wealth. This fear that everyone was out to get them. But what always fascinates me is the fact that so many other people were willing to go along with it and feel it themselves. This, this type of desire just for absolute control and this fear from those both above and below you. Additionally, and as part of this, I should say, this tendency to um, consider yourself as the aggrieved middle, regardless of how high up you are. Now, granted, it's not the four oil men who consider themselves the middle. It's the kind of the small rich, the little rich mentioned in the second article. I will make a little playlist putting both of these articles in their chronological order, of course. Enjoy them at your leisure. This is Facts Fivem. Hello, this is Facts Fivem, saying thank you for listening, and I sincerely hope that you enjoyed it. If you can, please like and share it around, and if you are feeling especially generous, please subscribe. I need at least 100 subscribers to change my YouTube channel's URL, and my default is long and ugly, and I really don't like it. It would be extremely helpful for me if you subscribed. But you don't have to. I'm not your boss. I'm just Fax Fivem. And right now, I'm signing off.